Good morning or evening, everyone. Welcome to the Toronto Geometry Colloquium. This is a weekly web series all about geometry processing. This colloquium aims at promoting young researchers and researchers from traditionally underrepresented communities. Every week, we will have an opener talking about their cutting edge research for 10 minutes, followed by a headliner giving us a keynote presentation. And today, it's my pleasure to present our two great speakers. First, we have Zoe Marshner as our opener to talk about hexahedral mesh repair via sum of squares relaxation, and Tian Tian Liu as our headliner to discuss efficient simulations of deformable object and beyond. And if there's any questions during the talks, uh, please leave comments in the YouTube live chat. And our opener, Zoe, is so far the youngest speaker in this colloquium. She's only at the second year of her undergrad at MIT supervised by Justin Solomon, but she already has a very impressive paper published at SGP uh, this year. In a nutshell, this paper presents a powerful technique for repairing hexahedral meshes, but personally, I think this paper is much more than that. And the most beautiful part is to showcase the power of sum of squares relaxation, or so-called the SOS relaxation. And I believe a lot of people here, like me, may have heard of this SOS relaxation in the optimization course, but not yet understand the importance or the power of this. But Zoe is going to raise our understanding of this technique to a different level from both theoretical and practical perspectives and demonstrate its power in geometry processing. Now, please join me to welcome Zoe to teach us more about this SOS relaxation through the lens of hexahedral mesh repairing. Thank you for the introduction. Um, let me share my screen. Oh, oh okay. Um, okay, so hello everyone. I'm gonna be talking about hexahedral quality evaluation of the SOS, SOS relaxation. And this is work that I did along with David Palmer, Paul Zhang, and Justin Solomon. So hex, hex meshing has been shown to be beneficial to, to tetrahedral meshing for certain applications such as finite element analysis. However, the creation of hex meshes themselves is still a problem that we have a lot of difficulty with. So for example, if you look at this bunny, um, we can see that some of its elements like the ones I've highlighted here um, are essentially turned inside out. Uh, and these elements make the mesh unsuitable for FEM. So lots of elements today still have uh, leads to meshes with elements like this. And so this leads to two important problems that we'd like to solve. First, the detection of these elements. And then secondly, the repair um, of a mesh with invalid hexes in it. And so I'm gonna focus on the detection problem first. Uh, and so first, I guess I'll talk a little bit about what we actually mean by invalid uh, hexes. And so if we look at the, like the hex on the right here, it's pretty clear this is invalid since like all the sides are intersecting. Um, but to be able to actually detect this, we kind of have to formalize this idea. And to do this, maybe first, we should talk about uh, what I actually mean by these hex. So this is a trilinear hex. Uh, and this can be viewed as a trilinear map from this reference unit cube onto the image hex element. Uh, and basically, we're just doing a linear interpolation along each of the each of the separate um, coordinates. And so you can see here that this leads to a hex uh, where the, the edges are just straight lines, they're linear, the faces are bilinear and so curved, and the inside is trilinear. Uh, and this trilinear map can just be accepted as a polynomial. So this looks a little bit confusing uh, maybe, but you can see that it's just like a, a linear uh, interpolation along each of the variables. And it depends just on the domain coordinates and then also the coefficient coefficients of, uh, or the coefficients depend on the uh, vertex positions of the hex. And so, uh, from this trilinear map, we can take the Jacobian determinant of the map, and then we get this measure of how the volu volume um, at any point in the hex changes, like if we take the volume of infinitesimal unit at that point. Uh, and so this is, this is really cool because now we can look at how, uh, like if this, if this Jacobian determinant is, in, is ever negative anywhere in the hex, then clearly the hex is like inside out there. And so then we want to consider it invalid for, uh, FA, for our like quality analysis. And so for example, um, this hex here, the, the minimum Jacobian terminus is zero. And so this is what we would consider the quality of this hex element. Uh, and so one way this idea is commonly applied uh, in practice still is to just look at the Jacobian determinant along all of the, or at each of the eight vertices. And maybe you've already seen uh, like from the example I presented that this is like not the best way to do this since we can miss a lot of um, invalidities inside the hex. And another way um, in 2017 was proposed by John and et al. Uh, and this is like a recursive scheme that solves this hex quality problem. But we're going to approach this kind of from a different direction uh, where we first look at the underlying optimization problem. And then we apply this powerful technique, sum of squares relaxation, which ends up being pretty widely applicable in geometry processing. Uh, and this gives us 
really cool results, um, including ones that can lead us to later uh, creating a mesh repair algorithm. Uh, so first, let me talk a little bit about why this problem is not the easiest in this form now. So it has this polynomial optimization or polynomial inequality constraint, which in general is not an easy uh, constraint to solve. And to understand why this is hard, we have to look at uh, why other problems are easy. So some of the typical like easier problems in optimization are linear programs and semi-definite programs. And um, the big thing that makes these two problems easy is their convexity. So they are both over convex feasible sets. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, our um, polynomial inequality constraint or our polynomial inequality, our polynomial inequality constraint is not convex. Uh, okay, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we can make our polynomial inequality constraint easier. And this is, can be done by sum of squares reallocation. So here's a quick outline of that. Um, we start with the polynomial p of x, which we want to be positive over some space, and this is a non-convex constraint. And then we can relax this to the constraint or to the like, constraint that p of x is s of s, which I'll show is actually the same as just an SDB constraint, which is convex. Uh, so how can we actually formalize this with math? Well, um, so the idea of a sum of squares polynomial can be represented as um, having a polynomial p of, x, p of x, which you can write as the sum of these q polynomials squared. Uh, and clearly, if we can write our polynomial p of x in this form, then it must be positive over all x. And so we can think of this as being a certificate of its positivity, the fact that we can write p of x as a sum of squares polynomial. Uh, and in fact, uh, if we do a little bit of algebraic manipulation, we can actually get that this, uh, the, con the constraint of being able to write p of x as a sum of squares polynomial is actually the exact same as being able to find this matrix A that is positive semi-definite and satisfies that constraint there. Uh, so in fact, we can uh, then just apply sum of squares relaxation to get to change um, optimize, optimizing a polynomial uh, or a polynomial inequality constraint to an SOS constraint, which I just said was just an STP constraint. Um, but the key thing here is that this is a relaxation because not all polynomials um, can be written, or not all positive polynomials can be written as some of squares. Uh, so that is where the relaxation comes in. And so this, uh, if you look at like the problem I presented earlier, the hex quality problem, uh, clearly this has a polynomial inequality constraint. But you might notice that it's over this um, specific domain. So how can we actually express, uh, uh, how can, like, to, to actually express this as an SOS problem takes a little bit more work. Uh, so we'll look at that now. Um, we, can write, um, we can write this, like the idea of it being positive over domain as it being positive over this domain that's maybe um, defined in like a special way. We have these polynomials um, f of x, which are greater than or equal to zero for some set of f of x's. Uh, and so if we have any polynomial that's written in this special form, so here we're going to come up with a certificate for positivity over this specific domain. So if we can write p of x as a sum of squares polynomial plus, uh, and then for each of the, the domain polynomials, the domain polynomial times uh, a sum of squares polynomial, if we can write in this way, you can see that each of the terms here will be positive over that domain. So then we know that the polynomial is definitely positive over this entire domain. And so we have this like certificate, like I talked about before. Uh, and the important result here is called Putinar's positive sum sets. Uh, which where Putinar says that for a high enough degree of these uh, these S, S, SOS polynomials, uh, we in fact have a black conditional here. So uh, this means that for any polynomial that is positive with this domain, we can write it in this form if we choose high enough degree S polynomials. All right, and so now we can kind of just um, directly apply this to our problem of, of hex quality. And this is what the resulting problem looks like, which is maybe it looks a little bit complicated, but it is just uh, like applying Putinar's positive sum sets exactly. Uh, and we can actually translate this into code pretty easily since uh, there's a lot of existing toolboxes for SOS and SDP problems, for example, Yelmec. Uh, and the one difficulty here is that the positive sum sets, as I just mentioned, requires that we take arbitrarily high order uh, for our sum of squares polynomials. But when we're implementing this in code, right, we have to pick a one sum fixed degree. Uh, and then we must evaluate later whether that degree was high enough to actually get exact recovery. And one way we can evaluate whether we got exact recovery uh, is to look at the difference between the value of the minimum determinant, which we can calculate um, by sampling, and the value that we calculate with our SOS method. And ideally, these would be the same. And so here we plot the difference um, for a sample of 50,000 hexes. And as you can see, all the differences are essentially zero. The scale here is times 10 to the negative seven on the x-axis. Um, and so, yeah, using this, we can detect uh, lots of invalid hexes and meshes. And so these are shown in red here. All right, uh, so that's really cool. Um, but one thing we might, we might wanna do uh, in addition to this is find uh, not just the location or the, not the, just the actual value of the minimum Jacobian determinant, but also the location at which that minimum occurs. Um, and so one way you can formulate this problem is as finding um, a measure that gives the minimum value when we integrate our polynomial against it. Uh, and so if we think about this, um, clearly the, the optimal value for this measure is just gonna be a delta function supported at the minimum of that polynomial. Um, and so this gives us this really great uh, like kind of simple or intuitive maybe 
uh, uh, problem that will let us solve the argument problem. Um, however, this minimization is over the space of measures, which is not something we can actually minimize over uh, easily. So instead, we can do something similar to the SOS uh, relaxation, where we uh, we do a relaxation from uh, optimizing over measures to optimizing over matrices of moments, which just represent the measure. Uh, and by doing this, we can take our moment problem and make this also into an STP problem. Um, so now we also have this moment relaxation. And you might notice if I put this against the SOS relaxation, they look pretty similar. And they're in fact dual problems of each other. Uh, and this is really important because this means, because like when we actually solve uh, in practice, when we solve an SDP problem, we also have the solution to dual. Uh, so we can kind of like get for free almost uh, all the cool things we can calculate from the moment relaxation uh, once we've implemented the SOS relaxation. And so you can see that here. Um, so here we're finding the plotting the argument of this uh, hex like as we change it. Uh, and you can see the red dot follows the minimum. Uh, and another really cool thing we can do from the moment relaxation is evaluate how good our, our relaxation actually is. We can do this by looking at um, how close the uh, moment matrix is to rank one. And we do that because as I mentioned before, uh, if we've achieved a perfect relaxation, we get a delta function as our moment and the moment matrix of a delta function is rank one. So here you can see um, almost all of the, for almost all the hexes, the moment matrix is in stack one, which is showing again that we have picked a degree high enough for exact recovery. All right, so that was the detection part. Um, and now I'll talk a little bit about how we can use this uh, to make a repair algorithm. Uh, so we kind of split the repair algorithm into two steps, uh, first repairing a single hex element and then repairing an entire hex mesh. And we do these both iteratively. Uh, and so we can do the repairing a single hex element iteratively by writing this problem where we want to find, um, we want to find vertices such that we move them from the original vertices to the minimum amount, but the hex is now valid at the point in which it was formerly least valid. And so if we just complete, if we, continue um, like repeatedly doing this optimization problem, we eventually hopefully uh, get a, a, a element that is no longer um, inverted. And so uh, that lets us repair a single hex element and then we can make this into a, a, um, an algorithm to repair an entire mesh by just, um, by just applying, this, um, applying that single repair element algorithm to each met or each hex inside the mesh. Um, and if we do it for each uh, hex, then we can uh, then, we, then we have like, we've repaired each hex, but we still need to make it into a valid mesh because we might have a problem like the one demonstrated in the schematic here where the, each, each element doesn't actually line up and make a valid mesh. And so if we do a step where we just take a weighted average of each element and make them back into a valid mesh, uh, then we can repeatedly do this, this kind of like iteration over and over again, and eventually hopefully get a repaired mesh. Uh, and so you can see here, this is uh, run on lots of different examples and here the red shows how much we actually move them. So that's how we can come up with a repair algorithm. And now I'll just talk really briefly about what's next for this. So I think one of the most important parts of this work is how cool SRS relaxation is and how widely applicable it is to lots of different problems um, where we have like low degree polynomials. And so for example, um, recently I've been working on uh, looking at the intersections and self-intersections of Bezier patches because these are just basically polynomials. And there's a lot of problems related to these patches uh, that we can solve really easily with SRS relaxation uh, just because we can like formulate them as low, as low degree polynomial problems and then just solve them with SS relaxation. And so I think that's really cool. Um, and yeah, thank you everyone for listening. The code for this is available at GitHub. Uh, the paper is on my website here. And if you have any questions about SOS or this paper or anything, uh, please email me. Thank you, Zoe, for the great talk. And because uh, we have limited, limited time, so we'll proceed to the talk of our headliner and we'll have a joint Q at the, at the end of the, the talks. And when it comes to a real-time physics simulation, and our headliner Tian Tian will be one of the first people come to our mind. And he's an associate researcher at the Internet Graphics Group in Microsoft Research Asia. He has a massive contribution to fast algorithms in both geometry processing and physics simulation. And this includes some of his early works, such as the well-known projective dynamics, and also his recent works on multigrid methods. And because of his research, and these days, we are already able to simulate a shape with more than uh, 600,000 tets with 40 frames per second without using any reduced space approximation. And this, this impact of being able to simulate it in a full space allows us to produce many geometric details, uh, such as wrinkle on the cloth during the simulation. And paying attention to these geometric details also reflects the fact that Tiantian is a person who pay attention to details. So we would like to thank Tiantian because he point, for pointing out a lot of potential issues in our early planning of this colloquium so that we can run this uh, smoothly. So without further ado, let's welcome Tiantian.
to teach us more about uh, efficient simulation. Sure. Uh, thank you, Derek. Is my screen sharing right now? Sure, yeah. Um, well, it's, it's really nice to see though you blast through all her slides uh, while still being super clear. There was a second I was wondering if Zoom had that like a 2x speed up feature over there. Uh, it's still very nice. Um, so I, I've been watching this very nice presentation since the last month uh, uh, following this colloquium. And it, it, uh, it's an excellent experience for me, especially after watching the last talk by Danny Kaufman uh, introducing their work on stable physics. I, I was, there was a little bit I was trying to change my presentation title to simulating elasticity without any guarantees. Because uh, in this talk, I'm not going to cover the collisions and the super accurate simulations. Um, my presentation will be more focusing on the efficient side of the simulations. This one is okay. okay. Uh, during this talk, I will cover some projects I've been collaborating with uh, my PhD advisor, Ladislav Kaba, and my friends, my colleagues, and my intern students here in Microsoft Research Asia. Uh, I like video games. That's the main reason I started my research in computer graphics. Here's the game I used to play when I was a kid, and I played two years ago on Nintendo Switch. The, the same virtual character looks much better than they used to be, thanks to the advanced rendering techniques. To me, computer graphics is a lot of fun because um, it always deliver realistic feedbacks to me, not, not only about seeing, uh, but also about how I feel when I interact with the virtual world. There are lots of things I can poke in this real world to see how they are, and I believe simulation techniques will be the key uh, to boost my virtual experience for the next 10 years. Depending on the applications here, uh, there are lots of different requirements for a good simulator. In game and virtual or mixed reality environments, high performance is always a key. And in, in serious scientific computing applications and uh, animations or VFX industries, accuracy and plausibility becomes more important. Uh, there are also applications which require both speed and accuracy, such as surgical simulator for training purposes. Uh, my research is more biased towards the, the performance side of the simulations because I really care about interactivity. So talking about simulations, it can be as simple as this. We feed the current state as an initial guess to an optimization framework and it spit out the next state for us. We keep iterating the states and finally we get an animation. To solve the optimization problem, successive linearization is usually required, making it really the main bottleneck of most of the simulators. The optimization form of one stable time integration scheme implicit Euler can be rewritten as this. Here x is the position of all the vertices we simulate, y is an aggregated vector uh, that encodes the current position, velocity, and maybe the external forces as well for the system, and e is the elastic energy of the object. The entire potential gx is sometimes referred as an incremental potential, as long as we can find a compromise between the inertia term and the elastic term to minimize the incremental potential, we will find our solution. We can for sure run our classic Newton's method to find the solution. Given our potential G and an initial gas X, we can evaluate the gradient and the curvature around it. And a descent direction will just be a direction that directly pointing us to the bottom of that Newton valley. But is Newton's method a good solution for real-time applications? Possibly no, because that depends really on the optimization problem itself. Our problem is a combination of a very nice quadratic problem and a not so good elastic potential. The elastic potential is almost always nonlinear and sometimes even non-convex, making Newton's method a slow numerical choice. So why can be non-convex? Let's, uh, let's consider a very simple 2D problem it consists of two springs. So those two springs share a common vertex in the middle and the rest of them are attached to the walls. If we move the vertex along the t-axis, we can actually plot the spring energy as following. It has two global minima, where both springs are at their rest lenses, and one local maximum, representing an unstable equilibrium. Depending on where you start, Newton's method may even give you an ascent direction without any fixing. So in that case, we have to do some definiteness fix to correct this direction. Now we've got an idea that our problem is hard, uh, hard in real-time application, but uh, it is a large nonlinear problem and we don't know how to deal with it other than using Newton's method. But at least we know that what kind of problems we'd like to see, all right? So we, we'd like to see some maybe linear problems. They are always good since we only need to solve a linear system once. 
And uh, uh, when it, things goes to nonlinear, we, we prefer to see small localized nonlinear problems so we can solve them independently. Uh, let's start from a mass spring system maybe. The energy of the spring energy is given by Hooke's law, which increases quadratically with the difference between the current spring length and its rest length. So the nonlinearity is hidden there uh, in the length of the spring where a square root takes place. We can therefore localize this nonlinearity by reformulate the spring energy by introducing an auxiliary variable p. Uh, this variable represents a vector whose length is the rest length of the spring and it can rotate wherever it wants. And once the endpoint of the spring is given, we can compute the best fit p vector automatically. Uh, note that computing p is already a nonlinear problem since the existence of the square root, but we don't care about it anymore because it is so tiny. So once we sum up the elastic potential for all springs, we find that the original nonlinear problem becomes quadratic in X and all the nonlinearity has been absorbed by the auxiliary variable P and its manifold. The new system almost doubled the degrees of freedom because the introducing of the variable P, but it has lots of nice properties. Uh, first, all the system matrices are independent on X or P, so we can pre-compute them. If we fix X, it is really easy to solve for P because we just need to loop over all springs and uh, find their best fit directions. Uh, note that these directions can be computed also in parallel since X is fixed. If we fix P, it's also easy to solve for X because the entire problem is a quadratic. And in fact, we can compute the analytical solution over here. And an even better thing is that the, the large linear system is state independent, indicating that we can pre-factorize the entire system for acceleration. And that invites us a local global solver, where in the local step, uh, where all the nonlinearity has been localized, we can solve many, many small nonlinear problems to get the direction vectors. And in the global step, we only need to solve one large linear system to obtain X, where the system matrix can be prefactorized. Here's a brush we generated using our fast mass spring system. The simulation runs in real time currently. Uh, so if there's one thing we want to remember from this mass spring system simulation, it will be the way we localize the nonlinearity. After we introduce the auxiliary variable, the original system energy becomes a quadratic form, which can be seen as distance between a discrete shape descriptor and its projection. Because that here, x minus x2 describes the length and the rotation of the spring and therefore decide the state of that spring. And the variable p simply projects that descriptor onto the rest lens. This observation opens a new direction for us to bring this idea uh, to localize the nonlinearity for to, to even the FEM case. Um, so after a discussion with Sofian um, back in the days, we generated a framework called projective dynamics to support more uh, energy representations. For instance, we can change the shape descriptor to something else. A linear combination of the position is a perfect nice descriptor because it is equivalent to the deformation gradient of a tetrahedron. And uh, uh, we can also change the manifold for projection as well. As long as we can clearly define the distance function, we can do that. So when choosing deformation gradient as the shape descriptor and SO3 as the target manifold, we can coherently simulate a thin sheet with different tessellations, taking advantage of the finite element theory. And we can also project the deformation gradient to SL3, which is a special linear group uh, with unit determinant to control the volume preservation property of a material. Uh, we can of course also use the laplace beltrami operator to compute the mean curvature and the project it, it to a rotated rest post curvature vector to measure a bending energy. So in short, the, the key idea uh, we had for our projective dynamics is still the localization of the system nonlinearity. The only difference between projective dynamics and the previously mentioned mass spring system is the different shape descriptor and more choices of the target manifolds. And when grouped everything together, we are able to use this projective dynamics to simulate uh, lots of constraints at real time frame rate. Here, the house is a plate. Nope. Okay, it is. Here, the house uh, 
is enclosed in a freeform deformer and everything else like the grasses, the trees and the clothes are all deformables as well. Okay, so why is projective dynamics so magic? <laughs> uh, there is another view of projective dynamics, which is a quasi-Newton method we had. Um, the original incremental potential in the first line can be reformulated with our auxiliary variable P in the second line. And uh, when we solve it in a local global way or in an alternating descending direction way, um, we, we have projective dynamics. But if we treat P as an implicit function of X, like the third row of in this slide and minimize it together with x, it will actually give us back the original nonlinear problem. Um, since we have no idea how to minimize this nonlinear problem, uh, we can at first compute its gradient. So the, the first part of the gradient is very nice and clean and somewhat familiar to us. But the second part contains the tensor, which is the derivative of px over x, uh, is a little bit intimidating. So what can we do about it? Well, turns out we don't need to do anything about it since the second part is always that row in projective dynamics. The geomet to geometrically understand this, let's recall the meaning of our auxiliary variable P, which is a projection. Um, any perturbation along the line G transpose X minus P will not change PX. Or in another word, uh, delta PX is always perpendicular to the line of G transpose X minus PX. Turning this second part of the derivative always zero because those two terms are perpendicular. That is great. Uh, we can further left multiply the inverse of the matrix M divided by H square plus L uh, to both sides of the equation, which will give us something we already knew. Because it turns out the analytical solution of one global step in projective dynamics X star uh, is simply the current state X minus a filtered gradient direction. Unlike Newton's method, which filters the gradient direction using the inverted Hessian matrix, projective dynamics simply choose a Hessian approximation to compute the descent direction. This is a very special Hessian approximation because the second order derivative of, of the elastic energy is replaced by the system Laplacian matrix. The descent method is sometimes referred as the Sobolev gradient descent method. And treating it as a quasi-Newton method enables us to simulate a variety of different materials without requirement of any specific quadratic energy form. For instance, we can run the simulation of the Ditto model with Korot or uh, St. Manny Kirchhoff or Neil Hukian and at, uh, at very similar costs. We are also able to simulate some user-defined materials using B splines without any problem. And we can further accelerate it using some textbooks method like LBFGS. So in, in this kind of uh, uh, descending understanding of projective dynamics, uh, where did the nonlinearity go? Using projective dynamics as a quasi-Newton method will give us a descent direction like this, and the nonlinearity of the objectives are fully considered in the gradient direction, and they are local because uh, when you're computing the gradient vector, you always have uh, lots of uh, local operations over there. And uh, all the nonlinearity will be ignored in the approximated Hessian matrix. In fact, the Hessian approximation we used in projective dynamics can be seen as the exact Hessian when we fix the projection variable P uh, as if it's not related to X. Since this approximation is blind to the projection variable, we can also think the Hessian as some special forms as shown on the right, uh, which simply wants to vanish the shape descriptor. That's why it does not care about the current state because no matter where an element is and how it is deformed, the Hessian always wants to pull it to zero with a constant quadratic energy. In, in some good cases where the elastic energy has almost linear strain stress curves and the moderate stiffness, projective dynamics can produce really good results, like the one shown in this twisting bar example with uh, as rigid as possible model. Uh, otherwise, the rad curve will flat out a bit earlier. Um, let me get a pointer. So if the um, energy is more nonlinear and if the stiffness of the material is higher, uh, you might expect a red curve flat out to start from somewhere from here. Um, and uh, it will be really flat. 
Of course, waiting for projective dynamics till converged is not a good idea. Because uh, 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 even me, I would switch to Newton-like method if I really want an extreme accurate solution. But projective dynamics, nevertheless, provide a very plausible initial results in almost no time. The battleground of PD is almost always winning the real-time regime, uh, which lies at the very beginning of the graph. So here's an example showing a failure case of PD. If we run the, if we turn the stiffness of the shell of the snail to several orders of magnitude larger compared to the body, it is not able to even rotate the simulated shell with projective dynamics. And uh, the, the shell should rotate because the bottom part of it starts to rotate when the collision happened. Uh, but PD failed to propagate this piece of rotation information throughout the entire shell. We need a better mechanism to pass this kind of information throughout the entire mesh. So now let me switch to another strategy we've been using in simulating uh, things like a two-way coupled rigid bodies and different bodies and in accelerating linear solvers. So two-way coupled rigid and different materials are common to see, especially for articulated characters like this panther or uh, even a human being, if you agree that human uh, Super Mario is also a human. There are Usually, they, they are usually modeled with both rigid bones inside and soft tissues outside, and we can interact with them. The formulation of the problem is really simple. Um, we have our degrees of freedom distributed in the flash and the bone vertices, and there might also be some joint constraints to constrain the bones. And all we want to do is to minimize a constrained optimization problem on the right. The objective is the same incremental potential we've been using before, and now we have some constraints. The first and second line of the constraints that, that uh, the, the bone vertices must follow a rigid body transformation from their rest post configuration. And uh, the last line, um, the, that constraint means that uh, some bones needs to be connected together using some joint constraints. So let's first ignore the joint constraints now because uh, it is beyond the scope of my talk today. Uh, you can still check it in our paper uh, for more details about how we handle the jo joint constraints. Now let's focus only on the first and second constraints, which couples rigid bodies and deformed bodies together. These are the these are these constraints are nonlinear because uh, there's a Lie group constraint as E3. Um, the bone needs to move in a rigid body transformation mode. If treated one by one, the first constraint is actually linear. It tells us that no matter how complicated rigid part is, um, all these vertices need to move together. And ideally, we only wanted to move in a translational or rotational mode, but since we cannot see the SE3 constraint yet, we can lose this rigid body requirement a little bit, allowing the bone vertices to move in the same affine transformation mode. And since affine transformation space is a linear space, we can therefore represent the actual degrees of freedom in vector X tilt instead of X anymore. And now X tilt encodes the affine transformation matrices for the bone vertices and the original DOFs for the flash vertices. Substituting this linear combination into the original optimization problem will give us a new one with different degrees of freedom as shown on the right. Uh, adding this linear group constraint back will finalize the problem, but this one is nonlinear. So here we can fit the problem into the shoes of projective dynamics. Note that other than the projection variable P, we now have an actual nonlinear variable TK, which represents the rigid body transformation in the constraint. Similar to projective dynamics, we can solve for TK in the local step without changing the pipeline too much. And uh, uh, once the projection variable is fixed, we can then solve for the, uh, a global step to, to get an X, which include the original DOF for flash vertices and the uh, affine transformation for the flash vertices at, uh, together. And we can also invite a, a alternating solver uh, for, for local global solves. So in that case, we are finally able to simulate the snail with a rigid shell without the sacrificing on the rotation mode on it. And note that the simulation, this simulation is even faster than the previous PD solution because now the degrees of freedom of the entire shell has been re restricted into a single affine transformation matrix, which only have 12 degrees of freedom. And once we solve the joint constraint problem, we can simulate deformable articulated monsters without any problem more. Uh, this poor falling monster has rigid bones inside its deformable body and the exterior rigid horns and teeth as well. And we can, uh, have a monolithic solver to solve the entire simulation. 
To stress test our framework, we can even simulate a constrained rigid body system like this bracelet. We show that in our paper that this simulation converges to a rigid body simulator, IBDS, and it automatically handles implicit time integration and the looped constraint. Uh, of course, it's also 10 times slower than the original uh, rigid body simulator because uh, uh, this is uh, not really ideal to use a deformable soft coupled simulator to simulate to pure rigid bodies, but uh, we just have an idea how it works. The, the key takeaway we find uh, uh, from this rigid soft body coupling project is that a fine transformation can provide a pretty good preliminary linear deformation. And those harder constraints like SE3 constraint can be taken into account afterwards in a separate step. And uh, depends on what we need, this uh, fine transformation shape, uh, a fine transform, the shape can be further deformed into something else as well. This allows us to set up a multi-grid solver to further accelerate our deformable simulator in GPU. Uh, there was problems in PD, as we mentioned, because PD heavily relies on its prefactorization, and the, this is not working too well uh, in parallel computing hardware. In this octopus example with 0.1 million tetrahedra, uh, 20 PD iterations will cost around a second per frame, uh, making it impossible to interact in real time. So why? Because uh, the key of projective dynamics is the approximation of the Hessian matrix. Um, now the A matrix is pre-computed, it's pre-factorized, and it's guaranteed to be symmetric positive definite, which is good. But uh, the, the pre-factorization might not work so well uh, for large-scale problems uh, because the, the factor for extremely large linear systems are usually memory consuming because a factor usually have more than 10 times of non-zeros compared to the original sparse matrix. And it is also hard to perform forward and backward substitution in parallel. Since linear solve becomes a problem for PD, we want to resort to, resort to multigrid to the rescue. Uh, the key idea of a multigrid solver is only to solve the linear system very crudely using a few Jacobi or Gauss-Seidel iterations, uh, which are referred as smoothers, and the pass the residual to coarser and coarser levels to, further, to be further smoothed. And then the course level passes a correction back to final levels. So we can do some extra post smoothing to the system to get an approximated solution. We investigated several multigrid schemes and find that uh, a galaxy multigrid is a pleasant point for departure. It is first very simple to set up. It works for any meshes and any restriction and prolongation schemes. It also handles the boundary conditions automatically. They are all very nice properties but it just does not work well with trivial pigs uh, of U matrices. We will see how we use our group that find transformation matrices to make it work. To build this, we first uniformly sample the coarser level vertices from final levels using uh, farthest the point sampling. And then we want to build an interpolation scheme that can be used to pass the information between the levels. As we know that U is an interpolation matrix that determines only two things. First, it decides the degrees of freedom of course level nodes. What kind of information do we want to interpolate, right? And second, it decides the interpolation weight, which is how we do the interpolation. Excuse me. The, the key idea of our method answers these two questions exactly. To be more specific, we allow the course level nodes to move in a higher dimensional coordinates, and we use piecewise constant ways to interpolate between them. We first lift the degrees of freedom of a course level node from three to 12, which lies in the affine transformation space we mentioned before. We called it uh, a scaling space coordinates because we were inspired by an Alex Sigraf 12 paper, the, the fast automatic scaling transformations. Uh, this space encodes more geometrically meaningful information such as scaling, shearing, uh, linearized rotation, and a translation compared to the traditional positional space where only translation is represented. And we find that this is particularly useful to cut down the size of the coarse grid more aggressively, typically to an order or even two orders of magnitude smaller compared to the original uh, multi-grid scheme. And the second thing we want to do is to decide the interpolation weights between two resolutions. So here we use a piecewise constant weights, which is a, a very counterintuitive. Well, we actually tried smooth ways at first, we, uh, but we got problems. 
let's say there are two nodes, V1 and V2 from the fine level, where V1 is smoothly controlled by N coarse level nodes shown in the red, and uh, uh, V2 is controlled by M coarse level nodes shown in the blue. So any edge between V1 and V2 in the fine level, which is one single non-zero in the A matrix, will end up by end up with M by M non-zeros in the coarse level matrix UTAU. This is very common to see in un unstructured meshes, making the sparsity of the coarse level matrices much worse than it should be. And those non-zeros will be passed as further into deeper levels, causing many issues in our memory footprint. Here we can see this problem more clearly in an actual matrix. This matrix is uh, constructed using 117K rows and columns, and it only has 10.4 non-zeros per row on average. This is a fine level matrix A. And when interpolating using smooth weight, here we interpolate using uh, bounded by harmonic weights, the uh, coarse level matrix, which has only 4.k rows and columns, will have on average 193 non zeros per row, and it will be worse and worse in, in further coarser grids. And our choice of piecewise constant weights will reduce the number to 37. Note that this is only a, a two grid V cycle as a toy case. When you pass the non-zeros to denser and denser coarse level matrices using smooth weights, it will hurt the performance of coarse level solvers a lot. While our choice of a piecewise constant weights will end up with more than 20 times faster compared to the smooth weight in a big V cycle. But what do we lose? Piecewise constant interpolation is supposed to be bad at scaling at least, all right? Um, well, let's see how bad it is. Let's say the, the, the blue thing is now our fine level mesh being controlled by only two green dots at, uh, at the coarse level nodes. If we move one node upward, a uh, smooth weighting scheme with linear bending looks okay-ish on top, and while the piecewise constant weights tear it apart. But we find that this cliff caused by the piecewise constant interpolation is not that bad, because the error it, it created compared to the exact solution looked like an impulse function, which is an extremely high frequency error. Uh, remember that high frequency errors are easy to remove, and uh, uh, when applied with some smoothers, we observe that piecewise constant weights might be bad at scaling, but they are acceptable in multi -grid, in a multi-grid framework because we, there will be also smoothers on top of it. Um, as a result, we choose to stick with the piecewise constant weighting strategy, and the because this is one of the key to maintain the sparsity of our coarse level matrices without causing too much troubles. And moreover, um, it also enables us to update multi-resolution system matrices efficiently when the finest level matrix A has changing numbers. Therefore, uh, we can support, for example, collisions better if we just use penalty constraints. Uh, like we've shown in these examples when we throw armadillos into a pachinko machine, um, here we don't really consider the self-intersections. This is a carefully contrived example there. Uh, only the collisions between the cylinders are considered. Uh, but uh, those informations are successfully passed into the mesh and throughout the entire levels of the multi-grid successfully. When looking back to this octopus example with, uh, uh, with 20 PD iterations, uh, without changing anything other than the linear system solve, our multi-grid method can accelerate the projective dynamics to about 40 times faster. With our method as the backbone of the linear solve, we can also interact with a deformable dragon uh, with 0 point million elements at around 40 frames per second. So uh, to conclude, <laughs> there are two main strategies we kept using throughout many of our works. The, the first one is to localize uh, the nonlinearity. We use this idea to formulate projective dynamics and the related project. And this idea can be carried out into many uh, different projects, like the one Zoe just talked before. We can uh, solve the problem, the SOS problem for local element first and try to group them together, and then do the entire process iteratively and hoping the entire match can be fixed. And the second one is grouping the similar elements using an affine transformation space. We found that one is particularly useful to simulate materials with very different energies, uh, such as the rigid body and deformed body coupling project. 
And the same idea can be carried out to build a hierarchical simulation framework that can, can be used to help to set up a multi-grid framework. So uh, what's next? <laughs> collisions. Oh, collisions. Collisions are always big issues over there, especially for real-time applications. Uh, there are two papers this year in SIGGRAPH 2020, uh, one from Mikhail Lee and one from uh, Gilles David. Uh, both of them are trying to localize the nonlinearity caused by collisions and propagate the collision information along the mesh using a single global soft. One use the projective dynamics at the framework and one use the ADMM as the, as the backbone. But uh, uh, there is of course no guarantee for, the, uh, for those fast collision treatments to be interpenetration free. Uh, last week, Danny Kaufman uh, talked about uh, uh, their IPC approach, which is a very nice uh, inter interpenetration free collision re response technique. But that one is also extremely slow, uh, not extremely slow. I mean, to me, it, it is slow because uh, it's super hard to carry it in, the, in real time applications. So um, making collision responses faster and more stable is still a very challenging thing to do. And also topological changes. Uh, projective dynamics itself relies a lot on the prefactorization and pre-computing of the system matrix, which uh, depends on the topology of the mesh. And also, uh, even for our multi-grid method, uh, topological change is super hard to handle because uh, once the topology is changed, we need to set up the, the multi-grid hierarchy also differently, and uh, that one is hard to, uh, to generate on the fly during the simulation. Um, the, the, and also, uh, we are facing lots of numerical challenges in real-time applications because, uh, uh, for example, if you want to simulate super uh, stiff materials but uh, uh, with uh, very high frequency vibration modes, and or if you are dealing with really bad tessella tessellated models, and, and both of them will cause your condition, the condition number of the system to almost explode. So uh, in that case, um, are we able to solve it in, a, in an efficient way? It's still, an, I will put an, a question mark over there. And also, of course, engineering is a very challenging thing as well. Uh, if we want to even scale the system to even bigger, we need some like a, a multi-GPU tasking in <clears throat> project. And uh, that one is also very challenging. So, uh, it seems like the talk is uh, shorter than I expected, but uh, that, are, that will conclude my talk today. And uh, thank you for listening. And uh, some of the code are available on my website over there. You can try to download it and play with it. Thank you. Thank you both Zoe and Tintin for the great talks. And, and okay, and we would like to, right now we will join the, uh, start the Q&A session and please feel free to keep posting questions on YouTube live chat. And, and I'll start with the question for Zoe. So, so one question is, is, can we use this SOS relaxations for functions other than the polynomials? Uh, so I guess SOS relaxation is like a uh, disparate polynomials. It's, uh, all the math uh, relies on like the fact that we can translate this like special form of polynomial into an STD constraint. Okay, thank you. And next is a question for Tian Um. Okay, this is a little bit long. So in the case where the bones is being controlled by the arbitrary force, maybe user interactions, what considerations we need to take, uh, maybe limiting the max movement of the rigid bone or per step? Uh, we don't really do that actually. Uh... Well, the, the paper is a little bit uh, more detailed than what I described over here. Instead of uh, refining it into an affine transformation matrix, we actually only uh, allow the bone to move in a, a rigid translation mode and a, in a skew symmetric matrix, which only has the three, de three degrees of freedom. So it is allowed to rotate linearly and uh, move linearly. Uh, if, there's a, if there's a large force exerted on the bone vertices, we still allow it to move in a non-rigid mode, but uh, uh, the local st global step will automatically bring it back to rigid mode after uh, five to 10 iterations. Okay, oh, thank you. Uh, and that's a question is for, for Zoe. So can we use a, the, this similar measure to measure the quality of other types of meshes such as TET mesh or like polyhedral meshes or polygon meshes? Uh, so I guess, I think for TET meshes in particular, like the Oh, the problem of quality is maybe not as interesting as the problem of hexes since it's a lot easier to solve. Uh, but definitely like one of the really cool things about uh, SOS is that like it's kind of modular in the fact that like you can just kind of like if you have another element that can also just be represented by a polynomial, we can just 
switch out the following we had for the Jacobian yeah. term and for that following wheel instead, and this will just work. Yeah. Okay. So definitely like any any kind of mesh element that can be written or represented as a polynomial, like map, like the hexes, uh, can, we can use this kind of thing for that. Thank you. And next question is for Tintin. Um, so uh, if a different sampling uh, scheme is used, can, use, uh, can this multigrid method be used to simulate some heterogeneous materials? Yeah, uh, that, that's a very good one. Cause then uh, when, we, when we were doing that project and uh, we only support homogeneous materials because we were using first as a point sampling method. And uh, of course, if we want to simulate uh, uh, heterogeneous materials, so for example, uh, a, a material which is hard to, to deform in one direction and, uh, and uh, sorry, uh, a material is loose in one direction and uh, is very dense in another direction, we need to sample it also differently. And uh, uh, we had a small project over here um, making it work and uh, we, we tried different sampling techniques and they do help. Okay, thank you. And probably another follow-up of that question is, is it possible sure. to use algebraic multigrid instead of like geometric multigrid? So uh, the, the nice thing about Galaxy multigrid is that that takes the geometric information into account and we find it's very easy to use. Um, algebraic multigrid, for sure, it is very uh, simple to set up if you consider it only on the, on the math side, but also uh, to my experience, it's also super hard to um, line the performance of al algebraic multigrid methods to be as performant as a geometric one. So, yep. I mean, uh, in, in this case, the, the Galaxy one is kind of a combination between, between both and uh, we, we find it's very useful in real-time applications. Okay, thank you. And another question for Zoe. Um, so could you use this uh, quality measure to repair a hex meshing, but by changing the connectivity of the meshing instead of moving the vertex positions? Uh, I guess, oh, it's an interesting question. Um, yeah, I guess in theory you could, it's maybe less of like, I think the step from like making or like the step that goes from solving like the argument problem to like actually making this iterative approach is pretty uh, clear when we're, when we're iterating over uh, actual hexes. And like, it's a lot easier to, I guess there's, there's a lot of SOS, like we've been looking into a lot of other SOS problems maybe related to hexes that like also operate in a single hex because that's like the, the place where the polynomial is. And so this is the place where we can apply these SOS uh, techniques really like efficiently. And so once we like, I guess once we like get into the part where we're like changing the connectivity, it's maybe like going away from the like realm of uh, uh, like where SS is directly applied. But yeah, that's definitely an interesting idea. And I guess like the, the underlying thing would still need to use quality, so. Okay, thank you for the, for the answer. So another question for Tian Tian is that, um, is there any particular material model that's difficult to be applied using projective dynamics? Uh, well, well, in short, the more nonlinear the material is, then the more difficult you will see when you try to convert it using projective dynamics. Uh, for example, Neil Hukian, which, uh, which has a logarithm barrier um, at uh, zero volume. And uh, we, we tried Neil Hukian material in our test cases, but we don't really torture it in, in extreme cases. But uh, I, I would expect if you are approaching the asymptote caused by the, the, the logarithm barrier, uh, then projective dynamics will converge much, much more slower compared to Newton's method. And in that case, you might want to switch to Newton if you really want to torture the material to the extremes. Okay. So perhaps something relevant to this uh, convergence. So is there any convergence guarantee for this like global, reforming this problem to this global, uh, local global solve manner? So uh, one thing is that it is guaranteed to converge because both local step and the global step are decreasing the system energy. So if something is monotonically decreasing and uh, it should converge maybe a thousand years later, but uh, <laughs> uh, and, and we find that the convergence of projective dynamics ex experimentally is pretty good at the beginning. And uh, uh, after several iterations later, it will, uh, goes asymptotically uh, along a linear convergence trend. But there, there are methods to uh, use projective dynamics kind of strategy and the Newton's method together. Like there, there is a work uh, called uh, uh, 
blended cure quasi Newton method. So the, the, the blending direct they, they blended direction between in, in some quasi Newton direction, which is very similar to PD and Newton direction, and then also use their special line star treatment to uh, to guarantee there's no inversion of the elements. Okay, thank you. And there's also one more question for Tian Tian. Is that mm -hmm. for the LBFGS method specifically? Uh, is it still possible to resolve hard constraints, for example, like collision handling? Uh, yeah, yes and no, it depends on uh, how you want to treat the collisions. In our work, we treat the collisions as a very simple penalty springs. And we find those springs um, are pretty used to, to be generated using some rank one updates uh, uh, updated by the LBFGS schemes. And, but uh, if, the, if the collision mode is much harder, for example, if you want to really use a hard co collision constraint is possibly also with, uh, with a frictional con contact model. Uh, in, in that case, we, we have not, we've not been using uh, the same unconstrained, up, sorry, the, the, the same constraint optimization framework and applied uh, with PD before. So I, I cannot tell, but my guess is no. <laughs> okay, and let me check. Okay, I think um, that's all the questions today. And uh, thank you everyone for coming to this colloquium. And let's thank our speakers once more. And, and we also want to thank the artist, uh, Lia Guok, for making such a great poster for this week. And next week, we'll be discussing our recent development on discrete differential operators uh, by Odesh Stein and, um, and Ashley Bong. And so see you all next week. <laughs>